we have lung cancer in non-smokers as well? We have lung cancers. The, in, lung cancer is the, the most important cancer. We have uh, every year we have 1.8 million newly diagnosed cases. And according to the World Health Organization, approximately 70% of them are clearly smoking related. Mm. Of course, it depends on which country you're working. I'm coming from Austria, from Central Europe, mm. Middle Europe, mm. where the vast majority, more than 80% of all the cancers, are s lung cancers, are smoking related. Mm. If you're coming in other countries, you have also cancers, particularly in Asia, in never smokers. The big question is whether this number is actually increasing or whether it's still more diagnosed compared to before. And, but nevertheless, the vast majority, more than 70% or 70% on the global level are smoking related. So if you want to defeat uh, lung cancer, uh, the smoking or tobacco control is the major uh, goal or is the major uh, strategy that will decrease this, uh, uh, this epidemic of cancer. For lung cancer, early diagnosis would be very uh, important because the prognosis is much better in early than in late stage disease. So there are now promising strategy based on low dose CT screening. The American trial, uh, screening trials has suggested the benefit for screening risk reduction with regard to lung cancer by 20% death reduction with regard to overall mortality 70% risk uh, uh, reduction. So screening is one Im promising strategy. It's not so easy to implement it, particularly in, uh, let's say, also in our country, in Europe, it's still some discussion. Some people say the data is, uh, has to be confirmed by other studies. There is a uh, Nelson trial in Europe ongoing. Some people want to see the data uh, from this trial and they are expected soon. I don't know whether this trial will have, uh, what, what the outcome of the trial is. Uh, but I think the agreement generally would be that uh, screening sh could be implemented in, 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 s in specific cancer centers. I think this would be a, a very good strategy. So to implement it, screening there, you have to have experts who read the CD scans. You have experts for follow-up because one of the major problems of screening, as you know, is the the high rate of false positive uh, results. So you get results in further in investigations. So this is one problem. How can you reduce this high rate of false positivity? One strategy is to, to, to limit the population that you screen, for example, more heavy smokers. Another strategy could be that you better define uh, those patients who need follow-up based on the tumor size. You could have not only the size, but the tumor volume, which might be more important. Then there's the possibility that you look into uh, molecular parameters, uh, for example, from the peripheral blood. There is some interest in this, whether you could better characterize those persons, smokers, who are at highest risk. And so that would be uh, improve the risk benefit ratio towards more towards screening. So I do believe that screening is a strategy that is worthwhile to implement it in major centers. And there's also agreement in com combination with uh, smoking cessation programs. How does, means screening is a good pro, is a good tool in hand, but when we talk of Asia Pacific nations and the low and middle income countries, many of them are there in this region. Uh, implementation of would yeah I, I, I would answer this question I think for these countries the main strategy has to be tobacco control so because this is cost effective and this is has in, and this is the strategy forward because I would not recommend screening at this moment for low income countries because uh, all the problems associated still uh, with screening and uh, there's still not an agreement in Europe, for example, in all the countries to implement it. So I, I'm not, I'm not uh, promoting this in low income countries. That uh, would not be the right strategy. In the low income, it has to be on primary prevention. Primary prevention yes. And then we go on to, uh, of course, uh, early screening, then diagnosis and treatment. Because again, we find there are, means a lot has happened in the field of treatment. Uh, 
uh, but availability of the existing treatments again in low and middle income countries. Yeah, yeah. Oh. This is uh, what we raise is very important. So what we are doing now is improving diagnosis. So we have molecular analysis, so better diagnosis, hopefully also getting new treatments. And we have advances. We have the chemo for years. We have the targeted therapies, particularly in Asia. We have this EGFR mutation positive disease, which you can treat with EGFR directed tyrosine kinase inhibitors, where we have a major advance. And now we have also immunotherapy. So we, we have more and more novel treatments. Uh, we have to better define these uh, patients who are going to benefit. So predictive markers or predictive biomarker is one research area. So we need novel treatments, but most uh, perfectly in combination with a biomarker that predicts those patients who have the highest benefit. And on like, overall, of course, affordability of treatment, access and affordability and sustainability is, is a major issue, which I do believe. I don't know this have the solutions to this, but I think these are important issues in order to, um, uh, in order to avoid major problems. One problem I see that if you don't, if not everybody gets access, this raises a lot of ethical issues, a lot of problems. And uh, I don't want the two class medicine. So this is an issue that we have to confront. And, the, and there's also discussion how you could, how could you better deliver these drugs? How could you decrease development costs maybe? How could be more competition of companies uh, decrease the money? How could reimbursement systems uh, work differently? So you, because I have just for example, if you have expensive treatment and people don't benefit, sh why should we pay for this? So there is, there are a lot of issues and we have to face other health politicians and doctors, doctors will face these problems. But I don't have the uh, solution yet. What about palliative care? Is it, uh, is it being undermined palliative care, particularly in case of lung cancer patients and elsewhere also? Palliative care is a major area in, in lung cancer. Lung cancer is a cancer which has the highest symptom load. So many patients with lung cancer have, have a lot of symptoms from cough, just my pain. These are major problems for patients. And palliative care is very important. We have palliative chemotherapy, but we have all this palliative radiotherapy and the more other supportive care measures. So palliative care is a very important uh, uh, area in, in the treatment of lung cancer and uh, at least in our country, Central Europe, Austria, we have palliative care units and but in addition we will leave, we need also palliative care teams that go to the patient at home or uh, so to provide home care, palliative home care and things like this are very important. Some people use palliative as symptom relief. Palliative is everything what relieves your symptoms to prolong survival, but you don't cure the patient. So the patient will finally die. And then this can be chemo, can be radiotherapy, and can be, and other people call also, some other people call palliative care, uh, take it in more stricter sense. Some people say overall it's supportive care. So there are different definitions. So. For me, palliation is, of course, chemo, it's radiotherapy, but it's all other supportive measures like, like uh, pain uh, treatment, pain management, management of tumor, management of weight loss. Usually, the tumor symptoms are much more than the side effects of chemo. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, uh, in patients with advanced stage four uh, disease, they get chemo with platinum-based tablets platinum-based chemo. Mm. I usually give cis platinum-based chemo, but we have a l very good anti -emetics. And so I don't have major problems with mm. the side effects. Mm. And I if you have a lot of symptoms from the tumor and can decrease the symptoms, you have a benefit. So chemo mm. does not decrease the quality of life. That's not the case. Yeah. So it's the tumor that usually decreases the quality of, of your life. And the side effects are usually temporary and they're managed. So I think we should, we should, be, we should not give the, the message that chemo has just side effects. So it palliates symptoms at the expense of some side effects which we usually can manage.